This is Brad Montgomery. Welcome to the successful, interesting, and awesome podcast where I interview people who are, wait for it, successful, interesting, and awesome. <laughs> or at least one of the one of those three. That sounds like a good time to me. Uh, well, hello. Have you been washing your hands? My name is Brad Montgomery. I'm excited today because I'm talking to a very old friend and a funny, very funny fellow. Uh, this guy has been a comedian since I wanted to be a comedian. He's been a speaker since I wanted to be a speaker. And let me explain. When I first started transitioning from comedy and magic to speaking, I got um, to be part of these showcases through a speakers bureau, which means middleman, which means agent. Uh, and uh, as part of that, they would parade a whole bunch of acts and speakers up on the stage and a bunch of buyers would look us over like a bunch of meat and pick and choose. And there was this one guy that just <laughs> got it. And I've been uh, admiring him ever since. Please put your hands together, which virtually probably means just stare at your screen as we bring in Frank King. Hey, Frank. Good morning. Good open, afternoon. Open your hearts to put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen. From <laughs> Frank King. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> What is it? it seems like in comedy clubs, you always say, this guy has performed in colleges and clubs across America. Please welcome. Like the, the yeah, that was, that was a stock introduction back in the day. Clubs and colleges all across America when you had no credits, of course. Yeah, and it's, it, the funny thing about that, Frank, boy, we just got into it. The funny thing about that was when I was doing comedy clubs, I was only opening. Um, and opening I, meaning you were the MC slash yeah, opener. So I was the, and in comedy clubs, that's the lowest part of the totem pole you and know, one of the most difficult jobs actually yeah i think there is some of that but also it's not as cool to say you're an opener as it is to say you're a headliner that's true and i remember and i was doing colleges at the time not for big money but i was getting like six and eight hundred bucks and kind of felt pretty badass and uh so i was introducing this woman please welcome Lori. she's done colleges and clubs all across and i'm like well, which colleges how's what are you doing i'm doing colleges and she never told me brad it's bullshit yeah. Well, you know, as I say to my clients, my speaker coaching clients and TEDx coaching clients, it's not a documentary. You know, it's just, you know, like embellish. It's poetic license, comedic license. Yeah. It's marketing. That's, Come on. That's funny. Somebody just told me um, the other, or asked me, uh, an entry level speaker, Frank, and said, How do I feel about embellishing and making up stories? Um, I know uh, you, you just said embellish. Does that rule change when you're speaking versus when you're a comedian? Uh, no, I don't think, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a matter of framing, I do believe. Um, the Somebody I met in NSA said, hey, you wrote for The Tonight Show, right? I go, yeah, about 20 years. And why is that not the first line in your bio slash introduction? So I did write 20 years for The Tonight Show. However, uh, the first half dozen probably were as contract labor on the road as a comic, because Leno was the guest host. And Johnny would pull up on a Friday and go, I'm taking next week off, which meant Jay had four nights, 18 jokes a night, started hiring road comics to, you know, to write jokes for him, topical jokes. The dream for the road comics, of course, was that when Jay gets the show and needs a staff, that you'll be hired and go inside, join the guild. The writers go, well, I never quite made that. <laughs> never, never made the inside, you know, the writers guild inside the NBC building. But, but when Leno took the show over for real, he kept on some of the contract players, including he kept uh, me on, and I stayed with him until he, he gave up the Tonight Show. So, I mean, it is technically true that I wrote for the Tonight Show for 20 years, and I just let people, you know, make of that what they may. I don't... Uh, what, was the, uh, what was the first joke you wrote that was said in the Tonight Show? Oh, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> um, I do. I did. Well, let, let's, if you'll let me modify the question a bit. Jay's first show when he took over for Johnny, I had two jokes on. So I had two jokes in the very first official monologue when Jay became the host of The Tonight Show. The first one was, guy in Texas got stung to death by bees. And the joke was, yeah, it turns out they weren't killer bees. They were just um, regular honeybees upset over the Rodney King verdict. And... <laughs> I know. Well, it's it's a little, it's a little uh, dated, but the second one was Dan Quayle said that Murphy Brown, sitcom character, having a child out of wedlock on the sitcom mocked the importance of fathers. And then Quayle said, "Where would I be without my dad?" Yeah, my guess, uh, Vietnam. 
So <laughs> two jokes in the very first monologue. Well, I want you to notice I didn't even I didn't have to make it up. I actually laughed. I know. Hard to believe, isn't it? Dang good jokes. Let's go back to the <laughs> beginning, my friend. How'd you um how'd you get into comedy? The uh the myth, I think, or I don't know if it's a myth. It seems like tons of really excellent comics came from um, dip, hard paths, a hard path, right? Difficult backgrounds. What was your background like? Uh, not difficult. I mean, my dad died at the age of 40 when I was eight years old. So that was difficult. But my mom, I, there, there were things in having one really good parent. And my mom had friends who, uh, you know, pitched in. Um, she was a, she gave the board, state board for nurses in North Carolina. So most of her friends were nurses. And when my dad died, nurses did what nurses do. They rallied around and every Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthday, Pop Warner football game, the nurses were there. I actually have a, a keynote called Everything I Need to Know I Learned from a Nurse. They say it takes a village to raise a child. No, just give me a couple of shifts of nurses and we'll get it done. I told my first joke in the fourth grade, my, the class laughed and the teacher was hysterical. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, I'm going to be a comedian. 12th grade, they had a talent show. Nobody had ever done stand up before. And it was 1975, right there at the beginning. Leno's gone to LA, Letterman's gone to LA. So it was sort of the infancy of the comedy boom. And I did, I did 15 minutes of comedy on stage. Of course, you know, I'm competing with uh, folk dancers and accordion players and that kind of thing. Uh, but I still had one. And I said to my mama, I'm going to be a comedian. She goes, you're going to college first. I don't care what you get. I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care, but you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. Right. So I went to Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill, got a couple of degrees, moved to San Diego with my high school slash college sweetheart. We got married, big mistake. We had nothing in common, but you know what they say, Brad, opposites attract. She was pregnant. I wasn't. So <laughs> by chance in San Diego, La Jolla Comedy Store, a branch of the one, the famous one up on Sunset. Back then they had three open mic nights a week. That's how big comedy was. And so I did open mics at the comedy. So first time I got on stage, I in, in the middle of my set, I heard inside my head, you're home. My second thought was I'm gonna do this for a living. I had no idea how that was gonna happen, which is probably a good thing. Because if I'd known how hard it was to make a living doing stand-up comedy. I probably wouldn't have given it a shot, but I did. Well, I'm curious. I, you and I are similar. I'm 55. How old are you? 64. You're 64. So I'm curious how you knew the business. And here's the backstory on that question. When I was doing, um, I got out of college because my parents also said goat herder. <laughs> but a, a educated goat herder. But I got out of college and um, I started trying to be a magician. And then I was suddenly a funny magician and whatever. But I had no idea how to learn to be a better magician. And even when I was working clubs, I didn't realize that could be school. Like that could oh, yeah. have been my path. And then I hear you talk about hitting all these open mic nights. You got it. You understood, oh, this is how you learn comedy. Did it? Who encouraged you or did anyone say like, Frank, if you want to be a comic, here's how this works? No, I just I felt a magnetic pull every time I drove by the comedy store. My first wife did not like the idea of me doing comedy, so I was not actually doing comedy. And, and I was, in fact, suicidal. Uh, and I realized, because I have something called chronic suicidal ideation, meaning for me, suicide is an option as a solution for problems large and small, always. So I realized, hey, I'm suicidal. If I don't change something, like start doing comedy and divorce my wife, quit my insurance job that I hate with a passion, I'm going to kill myself. My second thought was, wait a minute, I could divorce my wife, quit my job, Try comedy. It works great. If it doesn't, hell, I can still kill myself. That's how I got into comedy. And I went into the open mics. And my first wife and I parted ways. Met my now wife, but my girlfriend then. And I said to her in December of 1985, I've got 10 weeks of comedy booked on the road, which I thought was forever. Right. I'm going to go on the road and be a professional stand-up comedian. You want to come along for the ride? Figuring she'd go, oh, hell no. She said, yes. <laughs> we gave up our jobs and our apartment, put everything we couldn't fit into my tiny little Dodge Colt into storage. And we were on the road, she and I, 2,629 nights in a row, nonstop, no homes, just club to club to club to club for seven years and change. 
So that's how I learned the business. I had no idea when I was an open mic or how it all worked. Um, so at and, the time, uh, you, when you started out, did you go out as a feature act or what were you doing? No, mistake. That's what I didn't know. Because I was at the comedy store is where I, I started. And then the improv moved to town. The world famous improv moved to, to uh, Pacific Beach, which is right down the street, uh, essentially from the uh, comedy store. And I, in the world of comedy, I saw, as you said, opening acts, middle acts or feature acts and headliners. And so... I was a house MC at the improv. So I, I, I was comparing my comedy to everybody I saw who was coming down from LA. So in that universe, I was an opening act. I get on the road and realize I've undersold myself that I'm at least a middle or feature act. I had more press than most of the headliners because I, at this comedy club in San Diego, they had a PR firm and we got interviewed all the time. And so, yeah, I made that, that was my mistake. And Tom McTeague, a comic, said to me in Columbia, South Carolina, at the punchline after show, man, you need to be a worse MC and a better comedian. Otherwise, you're going to be an MC the rest of your life because they need good MCs. Right. And so I kept my MC skills, but I did. I beefed up my stand up. And then after after the 2,629 nights, a local radio station in Raleigh, my hometown, had an opening in a morning show, offered me a gig. And so that's how I came off the road. And then I took a number one morning show and drove it to number six in 18 months. <laughs> yep. Uh, somebody goes, you didn't just drive it into the ground. You drove that sucker into Middle Earth. And I did. Got fired, as you would. In radio, there are two kinds of people. People have been fired. People are going to be fired. And my manager, who I still communicate to this day, the guy who hired me and fired me, he said, well, go back on the road. I said, there is no road like it was before. But I'd always been very clean as a comic. So I thought, you know, I'll just make the, the jump to the corporate comedy market, the rubber chicken circuit. And so I joined the, the Carolinas chapter of the National Speakers Association. Mm. And if wait, you don't know. What year is this? Or, or around when is this? This is 94, 95. Okay. So I did about 10, did seven years of clubs, a couple of years in radio. And then 94, 95, I, I went down and joined the Carolinas chapter of the National Speakers Association. And if you don't know, their reason for being is they have a meeting every month and every month they bring in professional speakers who lecture, I guess, who keynote on the business of speaking. So it was a great place because, you know, comedy and, and speaking, you're both on a stage, but speakers called it platform and comedians call it stage. Comedians called it a gig, you know, <laughs> so and the pricing is different, way different. Yeah, I'm not a math major. But as soon as I realized how much how much money there was in being a corporate comedian, which about, about a factor of 10 or 20 times what you make an evening as a comic in a club, I thought, yeah, this is yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And, it's, 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 and because I'm clean, you know, the uh, HR people at, at, that oftentimes book the talent comedians um, give me a hard time every now and then about my fee because it was healthy. I was getting five grand for 45 minutes of stand up. And they go, we're paying you 45 minutes. I'm sorry, $5,000 for, for, for 45 minutes of just comedy. And I go, no, look, here's the deal. First of all, you're paying me for seven years of beer bars, pool halls and honky tonks and drunk idiots screaming, tell us some jokes we can dance to. Secondly, what you're really paying me for is insurance. So that when I get done with my job, you still have a job. Because you put a mic in the hand of a comic, they can do a lot of damage in a very short period of time. I, mean, I even had Speakers Bureau call me and say, look, I've got a new client. Uh, we need a comic we can trust to, to absolutely keep it clean. So I would go in because they knew that they knew I wouldn't, you know, because a lot of comics, club comics, especially if the show's not going well, they go dirty immediately. Right. Well, we've both been there sharing the stage with somebody and you can see them editing live, meaning they start down a premise and they're like, oh, wait a minute. This ends with the F word. I got to not use it. Or, oh, wait, this is about sex. I got to, so you see them start down the path and they're like, oh, abort, because they're just not yeah. used to it. Well, and I've told uh, speakers that I train, here's the deal. You can't just take the F word out of your act and become a corporate comedian because every act has a, a feel and a, I can't think of the word I was going to use. Uh, there's a tone and a tenor yeah. to an act. And you can tell, like I said, when the guy's editing on the fly, what the heck happened? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know what he wanted to say. So I was I was back there in the bedroom banging my piano. And yeah, I had a friend of mine, classic case, on this night show, a guy named Steve Kelly. Uh, he was in San Diego. He was a political cartoonist at the time. And we became friends. He's from Virginia. I'm from North Carolina. Uh, he's a conservative Republican. I, I'm so liberal. I, I have to have somebody pump my gas, otherwise I'll burst into flames. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but Steve's on the Tonight Show. Steve had an extremely clean act. I mean, the kind where after three or four Tonight Shows, they said if they needed a comic like last minute, San Diego's not that far from L.A., they would call Steve and he didn't even have to audition a set because they knew because of the way he wrote that it was going to be clean. So that was a fall well and good, except the problem with doing the Tonight Show is you do a 10 minute, what they call a TV 10, and then they pick the five minutes they want. And the problem is they may pick, you know, the first minute and a half of the first five and the second minute and a half. So it's all out of order. Right. So Steve's on stage and he starts into this joke. Have you guys ever read the, the ingredients in a carton of haagen and realizes it's got a dirty word in the punchline? But he's on television oh. too deep into the joke. So he goes, yeah, every the ingredients on the carton of it has a yolk of egg. What hole of ass came up with that? Well, Leno knows it wasn't approved, and he's over there laughing, pounding the desk, knowing that Steve just, I mean, but he, he was too deep in the joke to turn around. So he just he delivered, and, he, and of course, they asked him back. They knew why. And it was like, because he they put the set together, you right. know, that afternoon, for goodness sake. Yeah, it's so, good. Anyway. What, so uh, you and I met uh, showcasing for five star speakers bureaus. How did you get turned on to them? Uh, that's a good question. Well, you know, back in the day, back in the 90s, uh, early thousands, 2000s, speakers bureaus were a big deal. I mean, that's where I was probably getting 75% of my business. They go out and market to the associations or corporations. Corporation says we need a funny comedian, uh, clean. And so they send them two or three, and the client decides which one they want. And that worked out really well until uh, the internet came along and people could you know, find <laughs> search at will. And then the, I think the last recession killed probably 50 percent, if not more, of the speakers bureaus. And there's still some. I mean, the ones that have survived um, are, are, are stronger for it, but there are far fewer you know, now with the. And when I'm working with my speakers, they ask about speakers bureaus. I go, yeah, well, I'll hook you up with some speakers bureaus, but it's not the same as it was back in the day. You're going to need to make sure your social media is up to date and you, your SEO is kicking ass, you know, because if you can't find you online, they can't book you. Right. Well, the yeah, it's, uh, speakers bureaus is kind of a love-hate relationship, isn't it? Because well, you know, we love it when they give us work. We hate it when they take a big chunk of it. Yeah, but they do all the marketing. I had that conversation with my speaker. I go, look, they're, they're doing the marketing. All you got to do is go, yes, I'm available on the 2nd of November to fly to Dallas. Right. So, yeah, it's that sort of, you know, I, I'm actually have set. And I tell my speakers, look, set your fee so you're happy with the net. You know, if your fee's 5000 they take, uh, what, 20% uh, nowadays? Yeah. Uh, you're going to net 35 plus travel. I mean, if you're happy, you, you know, set your fee wherever it is you're happy. So right right now I'm I'm doing a gig March third for a speakers bureau. I'm flying to Florida. I'm doing it live. Whoa! Tell me about that. Yeah, it's, I got a call. It's uh, a speakers, a dash speakers. The guy called me up and said, Frank, you know, this thing is March third, Marco Island, Florida. Are you willing to get on a plane in the middle of a pandemic? I said, dude, I'm suicidal. Who? What do I care? <laughs> I'm probably your. I'm probably the only speaker you got on the roster willing to get on a plane to fly to Florida, where they think the, they think the whole thing's a hoax. So, well, that's my I, first live gig since yeah. March 13th last year. I think that's so ironic with the um, pandemic and our audiences because pre-pandemic, here was a perfect room for both of us, a, a corporate room. People, it's 10 a.m. People are well rested. Uh, the room is super tight. People are close to each other. The ceiling's not too tall. They're really close to the stage. All of those things are not a good audience with COVID. People close, no ventilation, everyone's tired. Yeah. So the yeah. irony is crazy. And just this morning, just before we started recording, I was reading an article in a meeting in Industry Council magazine. I don't know why they sent it to me. But it had a picture of, hey, look at how we're setting things up. 
and had a picture at one of the Disney resorts with just a single chair. Forget the um, tables, Frank. A chair, and then here, you know, six feet that way is another chair, and six feet that way, and that was the room. And they showed this, like, isn't this beautiful? See how that's great. And I'm just thinking, oh my god, I can't believe that is our perfect audience now. That is horrible. Yeah, well, you know, comedy and magic, comedy magic. Uh, it's I tell people it's a it's an elbow to elbow, asshole to asshole business. You know, they, I don't care how many people in a room. If there's twenty of them, put them all right down front and put them elbow to elbow. Because otherwise, right. it, it sucks the energy out of the air and the room. And I just uh, talked to a, a, a guy. Do you know the comedian Rick Roberts? Yes, uh, the Barney Fife, right? Yeah, nice, really yeah. nice guy and funny. He just did one live in person in Alabama um, and 8 a.m. No iMag or video magnification or whatever that's called. Um, and it was a ginormous room with 70 people in it. So it, it could have sat a thousand, but they had 70. Oh my God. And so guess what? They did, he, he did great. And yet they didn't laugh. Well, there's only 70 of them. <laughs> well, you know, there's a psychological principle. It's like the first couple on the dance floor. Um, people, I'd much rather perform for 50,000 people, or I'm sorry, 5,000 people than five people. Yeah. Because with 50,000, there's a diffusion of responsibility. You know, they don't feel like if they don't laugh, it's going to look, make you feel bad. Uh, in a room maybe with 70 people and a room that size, if they, you know, they're maybe a little nervous. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. To, but I opened up for Randy Travis a weekend in Michigan at a 5,000 seat amphitheater. And, you know, walked out and never broke a sweat. I mean, if, if 3,000 of them are laughing, <laughs> that's, yeah, it that's sounds, all you really need. Well, so do you ever prep your clients? Because I know we've both had that time where you go out and you are awesome. But because of the setup or the time of day or whatever the audience was doing beforehand, especially in the corporate world, they don't laugh. Mm -hmm. Do you ever try to spin that with your clients to, to say, like, don't forget, I killed it, even though you... There's no evidence. Uh, I, I tried it ahead of time to avoid. Yeah, and you know that the what I found is oftentimes depending on the part of the country or the part of the world, some people are more demonstrative than others. I'm sure you've had this experience. Nobody laughs, and they're walking out telling you how great you were, how much they right. enjoyed the show. Oh, Frank, and that I, is so clever. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like saying, "Well, thanks for not interrupting with any laughter or applause," um, <laughs> but they enjoyed the show. I. I, I'm sure you've had this happen before. I, I rarely go diva on anybody, but if I, if they're doing something setting up for my portion of the event and it's just, I know it's going to, it's going to be horrible. Um, they, one night, the, my favorite is the guy said, you're going to be performing over there behind the ice sculpture. And I said, no, the hell I am not. <laughs> yeah. You're going to look bad. I'm going to look bad. One or two things are going to happen. You're going to move that hunk of ice, or we're going to wait for it to melt before I go on. I don't care which one you do. Sometimes you have to save them from themselves. Well, wait, back up. Really? Because I've really? wanted to say that kind of stuff, but also this is the person who has a check in their pocket with your name on <laughs> yeah. it. If you, you want to get that check. Well, like I said, only occasionally do I go diva when it's that egregious. Right. Now, if they say we're going to put you on the other side of the dance floor from the front row of the audience, I'll say, well, you know, in my experience with comedy, it's it's very difficult to throw comedy across a dance floor. I, I, you know, it's always best if if the entertainer is not any more than about six feet from the first table. So maybe bring in one of those rolling pieces of uh, staging, you know, the like a ping pong table with short legs, and put it right there on the edge of the dance floor on the other side, so I'll be right on top of them. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm polite right. about it. In that case, if they said no, we're going to leave it at okay, fine. Right. Uh, so, you know, at least I warned them it was going to be that way. Yeah, it's it's a uh, but you know, like I said, they got they got to check with your name on it. Right, yeah, and you don't want to you don't want to be the prima donna. Uh, to me, that's a huge. I've never got that balance right, Frank, between saying I will freaking bomb if you do it the way you're thinking. You're going to spend yeah. money. I'm going to follow your directions, and you will be miserable. It's very hard to say that to somebody who thinks, oh, I'm uh, very experienced at this. I'm, I know exactly what I need and want. Yeah, I, and I, I, I've, I've often said, how come the, I spoke to an MPI chapter in Florida. 
And I said, you know, you're professional meeting planners. That's true. But I've done, I'm guessing 10,000 shows. Why ask the guy who's actually done 10,000 shows how it ought to be set up? <laughs> yeah, just set it up any way you like. It's fine. Right. Oh, God. Yeah, it's um, like I said, and I try to save them from myself. But sometimes there is no, you know, you're going to be out on the deck. Um, the, the crowd's going to be facing you in the ocean and next to you on the deck, because we're from Philadelphia and the hockey team is playing in the Stanley Cup finals. <laughs> TV's going to be right next to you, but we're going to turn the volume down. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be great, Frank. They're, they're going to love it. It's funny. Oh, yeah. I did that I, same thing, only it was a baseball playoffs or something. And, and it was a, a East Coast and, the, and Boston was playing. The best, the best... It never got. I was in Phoenix. Phoenix was playing the Yankees in the World Series, I think. And they had it up on a big screen in the room where we were having dinner, where I was going to be performing. And so, but they figured it would get out of hand. You know, it wouldn't be the cl- score would be close. A time it was time for me to come on. You know, one one two two three three. Finally, the guy comes over, hands me a check. He goes, "Look, Frank." Uh, you know, if I put you up there and turn the ball game off, people are just going to go to the bar or back to their rooms to watch the game. So here's your check and enjoy the game. Brilliant. Yeah. Because everybody, everybody's happy. I mean, you know, everybody got to, and the game went nine innings. I mean, it was a great game. Right. Because I watched it all. I mean, I got paid. I want to sit there and <laughs> collect I've, my money. I have never once said that to my clients. Like, all right, I'm prepared to fulfill this contract. So you're going to have to pay me, but if you're smarter not to do it, don't put me up there. Let the audience watch the game. I've never said that. No, I didn't. Unfortunately, fortunately, I mean, I would have gotten up. Um, what, what I always say to him, look, short answer is you, you know, you are in charge and I will do whatever it is you asked me to do. However, uh, in my, my, in my um, experience, whatever it happens to be, you know, don't give away the trip to the Bahamas and the flat screen TV before I go on, because that's all anybody's <laughs> waiting for after dessert. And they said, no, they'll stick around. There were a thousand people when they pulled the drawing. There were 200 for my presentation. I told you. I didn't I didn't say to them I told you so, but I just, you know. And a friend of mine, Jan McGinnis, and I will tell you, I taught her this. You always, you know, it's a bad show if after it's over, you can't find the meeting planner. If they're avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, I find that to be hilarious for two reasons. One, you're right. And two, sometimes you're wrong. Meaning um, at a big conference where they have, you know, 30 breakout sessions at the same time, you might be a mm-hmm. general session, but there's still other stuff happening, which means our meeting planners have a lot to do besides sit around and watch us. Yeah, oh yeah. But when that happens, when you come off, I intellectually I know like, okay, this meeting planner is running around somewhere. But it also just kills me because like, well, that doesn't does that mean she didn't like it? Did, did I fail? Because I'm you know manic enough and insecure enough to go like, but I, I I need I need a hug. Well, and to protect myself, learned the hard way. I had said a meeting planner beforehand. Listen, if things go well, and I believe they will, would you mind doing a little 30, 45 second? you know, testimonial video for me. I'll ask you the questions, you know, hi, who are you? That kind of thing. And so they either you say yes or they defer to, no, Bob's much better than that. Okay, Bob, when right. I'm done. So at least twice I've recorded how much the executive director enjoyed the presentation and then got a call of the speaker's bureau. Well, you know, somebody on the committee or something didn't really like I go, well, let me send you the video of what the executive director had to say. (laughs) Yeah, twice it's happened where I had, you know. I also collect uh, video testimonials, but I've never thought about that, that it's insurance. Yeah, oh, yeah, because somebody on the committee, you know, might, might, uh, I had it happen once live. I was standing next to a woman named Susan Gazetta. She's a San Diego Speaker Bureau person. And it was after the show. And the executive director walks right up, same thing, no camera or anything, but said the same thing in front of Susan. I'm glad she was there and me because somebody else from the company called the next day and told how much, you know, it wasn't that great a show. Not everybody didn't, you know, and then 
And Suzanne goes, um, I was standing there when the executive director came over and told us how much she enjoyed the show. So, because the, the whoever was probably looking for some money back or something, I'm guessing. Right. And plus, uh, I call it the and another thing. They get at the bar, not after you, but like a day and a half after. And someone says, I'm not sure Brad did, was that great. Um, oh, and another thing. He told a joke about pizza. Pizza jokes are stupid. Right. Yeah, and another thing. He talked about airports. Come on, we're done with airports. And really, they start to convince themselves that it sucks when at the time they were perfectly happy. Yes. Uh, my wife and I still laugh to this day. I did a gig for Mike Frank, Speakers yeah. Unlimited. Yeah, the, the, yeah. If you can make Mike happy, you can make any speaker bureau happy. Mike's got a little touch of OCD. Anyway, <laughs> I did a show, um, and they had me standing in some odd place. And so I said, "No, look, what's wrong with the stage? <laughs> so it was like a built-in. I go, it'd be really good over there." So and I did it. And Mike called me. And he goes, the "Client's not happy." I go, "I got a standing ovation." He goes, "Yeah, but the client says your pants were wrinkled." Uh, my wife and I joke about that to this day. I'll say, I'll say to her from somewhere, I had a great show tonight. she go, yeah? Oh, were your pants wrinkled? Well, the, this guy, we're kind of dancing around the fact that there's two parts of our job. One of them is to get up on stage and be good at our be good at being on stage, whatever that means. Yeah. And the other thing is you got to get booked. You got to make sure that you have testimonials. You got to make sure that people aren't whining about you for some dumbass reason. I, I did this gig once with the Bureau of Frank. And um, I used to do this all the time. I'd call the client from the hotel phone, remember? Because we didn't have cell phones. And right. I'd say, hey, I'm here in the hotel. Or instead of saying, I'm here in the hotel, can't wait, I'll see you at the sound check. Uh, I would say like, oh, big problem. Um, plane was diverted. I'm in Cleveland. I can't get there until tomorrow night or whatever. And then there's silence. And I'd say, just kidding. Ha, ha, ha. And usually they go, oh, you made my heart stop. He's so funny, this guy. Tease me. So then... I did that joke and then I show up at the sound check and the staff for the meeting said, Oh, Brad, there's been a big problem. The uh, electricity's turned off. So um, we're not going to be able to have microphone or lights, but we do all have candles. We're going to put a couple candles on the thing and uh, we're, we've got a blow a bullhorn we're going to get for you. And, and then they're like, ah, oh, kidding. Ja. And so what that said to me was we're family. Like, okay, yeah, I, yeah, they I get joked it. right with these people and we're together. But then a day and a half later, the bureau calls me and says, you told them you're so unprofessional. You were, the, I will never hire again. You, they hate you because you made these jokes. I will never have a client joke with, you know, be so disrespectful for my client. And I'm like, I played them perfectly. And they responded in kind, which is beautiful. Right. If they were teasing me back. Well, let's, let's talk about the business. Uh, so you, seven years in a row, two years radio. Now you're working with speakers bureaus being and sold. Doing, yep. Stand up comedy, clean corporate comedy. Making, right. So this is kind of like after dinner entertainment at the banquet. Yeah. After lunch, occasionally after breakfast. Right. Did um, you, um, did you start to say like, oh yeah, I'm also a speaker now. Or were you only doing... No, I, I was always jealous of speakers because they had something to say. They had content. I joined, I went to, from the Carolinas chapter to the San Diego chapter. And they were all about content, making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was, I didn't tell them this, but I was always jealous because they had something to teach people. Because I always wanted to be a speaker who was funny in addition to being a funny speaker. My tagline in San Diego was make a, make a living, not a difference. That was what I was famous for. I was the only person in SA without, you know, a message. I always wanted one. I just could never figure out what in the heck. And over time, I, I put together a networking speech wrapped around my mom. Her name was Dixie, and it's called WWDD. What would Dixie do? She was a great networker. And I put together, and I've had all these cardiac issues: two aortic valve replacements, double bypass, heart attack, three stents, and. So I have a cardiac comedy at 25 minutes solid on all those procedures, plus some other odds and ends. So I had a cardiac speech and um, let's see net networking, cardiac, uh, funny motivational speech. Right. But nothing really, I mean, they're not really splitting the atom on any of that. I mean, the, the stories about my mom and the networking, it's good, solid advice on networking. I learned in her knee. I didn't know I was learning, but I did. 
Uh, the cardiac thing, you know, if you hire me, I can, it's like living heart healthy happily and all kinds of content on diet, exercise, meditation, medication. But, you know, again, not really setting myself apart. And then comes a recession, 2007. My comedy career, my comedy, corporate comedy drops off like 80% mm. in a year or two. I'm, I'm living on credit cards thinking it's coming back, it's coming back, it's coming back. Didn't come back. Uh, filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy in 2010, April 2010. That's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tastes like. Literally. I had time, place, and method selected for my suicide because I had a million-dollar life insurance policy. So my wife's going to be brokenhearted, but she's not going to be broke. It's something that people with suicidality, suicidal thoughts, it's called burdensomeness. They think, and I thought the world would be better off without me. My wife would certainly be better off without me. I'm worth more dead than alive. See, people think the suicide is a selfish act, and from the outside looking in, it is. Didn't you think about the people who's going to leave behind? Matter of fact, I spent a great deal of time. Uh, for her, I was going to put a gun in my mouth, blow my brains out, so she get a million dollars. So fortunately, as luck would have it, policy had a two-year suicide clause. We were April is 22 months, not 24. So I got two months to go before I can kill myself. Yeah, wow. but because, of, because I have chronic suicidality and I'm willing to pull the trigger any time, I can wait two months. I can do it six, day 61. Fortunately, day 61, I didn't even, didn't even cross my mind. And two and three and four, I can't remember when I had my next thought. Like, wow, I'm still here. How could that be? So, um, and meeting planners started calling, meeting planners, speakers, bureau. I said, Look, Frank, things have changed. We can't pay you five grand to come in for 45 minutes of just comedy. You've got to teach our audience something. Right. And so I started casting about, and I read Judy Carter's book called The Message of You, Turning Your Life into a Money-Making Speaking Career. Well, I went into it thinking I got nothing. And she walks you through sort of step-by-step step, fill in the blank. And by the time I got halfway through, I thought, son of a gun, I've got something. I know exactly what... Because my whole family is is nuttier than a squirrel turd. And I had that close call with suicide. My grandmother died by suicide, my great aunt, my mother. And so I'm thinking, I can speak on mental health, mental illness. And then I thought, I need takeaways. I need learning objectives, able to's, how to's, action items. Right. So I, I took three courses on mental health, mental illness over time right. to, to give me the meat of my keynote, what I'm teaching them. Uh, so that's my lived experience with content, takeaways, you know, teach them something. And then the humor added in, you know, funny, not jokes, but funny stories. A medium planner called me after we moved to where we live now, N knew full well that I put a gun in my mouth. I'm going to keynote for her. Need to get that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Need to. She, I'm keynoting for it. And I said, well, Michelle, what do you want me to cover in the keynote? She goes, I don't know. Just give me some bullet points. So I let that hang in the air. Waited. She goes, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, because I almost killed myself with a gun. I said, Michelle, I'm just kidding. I, I said, it was a fastball in the strike zone. You don't think I'm going to swing at that? Come on. It was a great setup. <laughs> so, so I realized I could speak on suicide prevention. So 2014, I had to rebrand. You know, rebranded from a club comic to a corporate comic. Now, corporate comic to corporate speaker. But everybody thinks of me as just being funny. So how the heck am I going to rebrand? My wife goes, do a TEDx. I said, what's a TEDx? Famously. On this website, kind of an electronic speakers bureau called Speaker Match, there was an application. Do you want to fill out an application for TEDx in Vancouver, BC? Absolutely do. Set it up. I flew up to Vancouver for the audition and nailed it. My, it's a it's a it's a horrible you know the, they wanted five minutes of my story my right. TEDx so I, I you can either give them an overview or give them a piece of it well I don't know if you've seen my first TEDx and by the way if you're easily triggered by things dealing with death and suicide and whatever now's the time to turn it down for about 60 seconds and come back so you won't get triggered <laughs> okay um my, my mother and I, my mother worried my great aunt, she'd already had her mother die by suicide and couldn't reach her that day and went over and found her. And then my mother called my great aunt, couldn't reach her, you know, given the family history and their, my great aunt, my, my grandmother, sisters, my mother got really worried. So she bundled me at age four years old into the car. And we went over to my great aunt's house and we went, let ourselves in. There was nothing out of place except in the kitchen, 
on the counter, buttermilk, eggs, cheese, everything that should have been in the old lock type refrigerator. This is back in the 50s, early 60s, where they, the refrigerator didn't have a magnetic seal. They had a handle. You lock and unlock, essentially. Yeah, like oh, I remember those, like a latch. Yeah, exactly. That's why when I was a kid, they always took the door off of refrigerators that somebody had thrown out because they're afraid some kids are going to crawl in and not yeah. be able to get out. Okay, well, my mom didn't tumble to why all the stuff that should have been in the fridge is on the counter. So I'm holding on to her skirt. She walks around. She grabs the handle on the lock type fridge. What she didn't know was my great aunt had crawled in, oh. pulled the door to, at some point changed her mind and tried to claw her way out. So you can imagine the blood, the broken nails, the look of terror last moment on her face. My mother opens the refrigerator door. My great aunt falls out and pins me to the floor. We're face to face on the floor. Her face frozen that last moment of terror. I mean, I, apparently I screamed for days. Yeah. Days and days. So I added that to my family history. And I thought I can speak on, you know, suicide prevention now that I've rebranded with this TEDx. And so I began to speak. I did four years where I was still doing networking uh, speech, right. cardiac speech, and marketing those, and comedy. 2001, January, January 1st, I looked around town to see who are the most successful people. Look, you know, why are they successful? And it hit me. They do one thing, and they do it extremely well. So on January 1, I decided I'm not, I'm not marketing anything else. I'm a suicide prevention speaker, period. I mean, if somebody calls and says they want comedy, I'm not going to turn it down. And Frank, when was that? What year was that? That was uh, January 1st, 2018. 18. Yep. All right. So, well, all right. So I'm so I'm curious about this mental health comedian thing. Um, yeah. Instead of going into your content and your story, which, by the way, that refrigerator is horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what got me the TEDx, because when I told them that five minute slice, including that, they were like this. Yeah. Apoplectic. I mean, I knew it would have that impact. Uh, right. And it did, it did on stage at the TEDx as well. I mean, it's a gruesome, you know, it's like horror movie gruesome. So, so yeah, then, in fact, if that was in a horror movie, the director would say, that's a little too much. It's over the top. Doesn't seem believable. It's too yeah. bad. It's too horrible. Just you have to land on it and pin it, just have her open the door, you yeah. know, and then see her would be enough. No, somebody said to me, have you ever been impacted by a suicide? I go, yeah, the old bat fell out on me. Impacted, yeah. Yeah. Trapped by. Well, tell me about this. I have talked to other speakers who have heavy topics. They're talking about, um, I have a friend who talks about losing his uh, identity. Um, and it w was horrible. Um, and cancer survivors and people who talk about sexual abuse and surviving sexual abuse. And, um, mm. and now you're talking about being suicidal and living, learning to live with that. How do you do that on stage and then come off stage and go like happy, happy? Like, it, does it make <laughs> yeah. it worse? Or is being on stage talking about these heavy things that have such a personal hook for you, is that therapeutic? Does it make you happier? Well, it's therapeutic, and here's why. I have a major depressive disorder, better known as depression, and chronic suicidal ideation, which means for me and people like me, option suicide is always on the menu as a solution. Large and small, my car broke down. I had three thoughts, unbid, get it fixed, buy a new one, I could just kill myself. And I say that to the audience. And every keynote or training I've given since 2014, there's been one person, at least one person in the audience, sometimes more, who have chronic suicidal ideation, but did not know it had a name. They just think they're some kind of freak and completely alone. I had a woman come up to me at a dental function, a dental convention, and everybody else is walking out of the room after my keynote. She's coming toward me, and I can see she's crying. When she gets up to me, she's weeping so hard she cannot speak. And I said, you have chronic suicidal ideation. She nodded. I said, you didn't know it had a name. You just thought you are some kind of freak. Nod. Mm. I said, well, do you have a therapist back home? Nod. I said, well, call them up, set an appointment, go in, tell them what you learned today. And for God's sakes, tell them you Googled it. You didn't learn it from a comedian. <laughs> and I got a note. An email from her a week later said, Frank, I think I was at the dental convention simply to meet you. You changed my life. And I cannot say that about a lot of people, oh. which is very thick. And I get a note every uh, like a 
Twitter DM or, uh, you know, something on YouTube about my video like that, you know, helped them over a rough patch. Um, I reached out to a woman on Twitter to connect. It's an algorithm, buddy of mine, charged me all 50 bucks a month to reach out on Twitter uh, for certain keywords in a profile. Anyway, she, it starts off, I can't believe it's you. I'm like, what? I can't believe it's me. Uh, yeah, she goes, I watched your video last fall at my lowest point. And I, I you know, I, I was thinking about ending it. And I, I mean, I, I, you were so open and so honest and so vulnerable about your struggles that I thought, you know what? I, I think I can hang around. She goes, I believe I'm still here because of your YouTube. I mean, um, amazingly therapeutic for yeah. me. I mean, it's, you know, it's save a life. It's, it's, well, it's I first uh, got involved with the National Speakers Association. I heard this word a lot, the calling. I am called to share this message. And I'm, I think most comics are cynical enough to go like calling. I'm called to get a paycheck. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a... <laughs> But when I hear you talk about these um, people reaching out to you and saying, dude, I needed you at that moment. Um, maybe do you think this is your calling? Oh yeah, people ask me how do you how do how do you choose depression thoughts of suicide as a topic? Well, I'll tell you the truth, the topic picked me. It's a club nobody wants to join, but here we are. And when I when I'm coaching TEDx and speakers, if there's something organic about them, they can speak on on a TEDx, like a like near suicide attempt or whatever. I've got a client who has narcolepsy, and and she has a book on narcolepsy, and she has a foundation on sleep. I mean, it's it's just it's her. And so if she's doing a TEDx on, she'll give tips to people who, who perhaps have a sleeping disorder, don't know it, which is one out of five people, but she'll also have tips in there for the other four people who just would like a better night's sleep. But I mean, she eats, sleeps, breathes, you know, narcolepsy. And so I think there are some of us who are called to, I believe it is my purpose and my passion, uh, right. my passion, certainly my purpose to, you know, I mean, it's the because I have that unique experience of of staring into the abyss and coming back. Um, sometimes, you know, people say to me, why did my son want to kill himself? And I say, well, you know, I don't know if this is any comfort to you, but the majority of people who die by suicide do not want to kill themselves. They simply want to end the pain. Which, you know, is something of a comfort in that situation, you know, because if parents always feel guilty, you know, yeah. because what I could have done, I could have, and that's the thing. That's what I teach. People say, he never gave any indication he was going to kill himself. Yeah, he did. Eight out of 10 people who are suicidal or ambivalent, and nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to it. So the vast majority of people want you to know do something and step up. And that's what I teach is what, to, you know, what to listen for, what to watch for, what to say, what to do. So, yeah, no, I find it very therapeutic. I don't find it, uh, well, that, you know, I get choked up on stage. Odd, it makes me happy to hear that you found found this thing that it sounds like you really trained Frank your entire adult life to deliver these talks. I think it's one of those things where everything I've done kind of came together in that moment of January first, two thousand eighteen. You know, the humor and the suicide, and my family history. You know, because I. I did, you know, you hear speakers. I think I'll talk on customer service. Right. So, <laughs> Why? Because I looked it up. Yeah. It's very popular, marketable, and bookable. Great. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, the speakers bureaus are, and several of them, we have the same conversation. I speak on suicide prevention. What else? That's it. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. That's what I speak on. Because I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying with my clients, speaking coaching clients to do, I go, like, we want to make you not a commodity. We want to make when people come looking for whatever kind of speaker, whatever topic, they come looking for you, not just for another speaker on that topic. I mean, it's a long pull. It's going to take a long time. I've only had a few calls where they were actually looking for me, but it, you know, it's begun to happen. If you, if your brand is strong enough, then you know, and your SEO is good enough. <laughs> well, it's my path is similar in such a lightweight way, and let me explain. I was. Uh, magician, then just funny, then a funny motivational speaker. I, I basically had no weight at all. <laughs> it was the most flimsy of topics. Um, and then I started talking about the happy science of happiness because around 
right around the, the recession, that sort of became a thing that we were reading about that. And I got all over that. And then finally, I grew up, Frank. So like <laughs> I'm sorry, Peter. Late your 40s, and I realized, why don't I just talk about things I really care about personally, like my own freaking wisdom? Like, why can't I not stand on stage and say, I'm 47, and I know this is true? And when I did that, my the business changed. It's just what you're saying. Like, I picked one thing. I believe in it. It's not something I read. It's just something I believe in. Yeah, you pick, as Jane Atkinson, I think, says, pick a lane. And then for those who are speakers or aspiring speakers who happen to be listening, I know I picked a lane, which is suicide prevention. Then as I tell my clients, you need to find out who your ideal customers are. And an ideal customer for somebody like us is generally an association that has an annual meeting, uses outside speakers, got a budget that will float our fees. And most importantly, they have a bleeding need to hear what I have to say. So I picked dentists, veterinarians, physicians, and construction. Top Wait, dentists, four. veterinarians, physicians? Construction and physicians, yeah. And those are all uh, statistically high suicide groups? Yeah, construction is number one. Then no, fishing, please. farming, yeah, you no, know, construction, excavation, mining, fishing, farming, forestry, and then come the white collar, veterinarian, dentist, physician, and then first responders. So, yeah, it's, so I picked four of the, now all 10 of those are not working hard to bring down the rate of suicide. I, I kept trying to get hooked up and do con ag conventions with farm bureaus. And somebody actually said they couldn't believe I'd be rude enough to call and talk about that. Go, oh, you're like in the top five at risk occupation for suicide. So, but I found well, those four have I, a. So walk me through the business because I'm picturing myself. I'm I need to book a keynote. Um, yep. I know you're funny. I want that. I know I want a topic because I need something to sell to my members. But then I think, oh, suicide. No, I don't want that because I that doesn't seem happy. <laughs> so um, you're going to tell me, well, you need it, and then how? What what happens next? Well, actually, the I don't get a lot of I don't pitch a lot of clients myself unless they find me. The speaker bureau is, of course, pitching clients, uh, dentists, veterinarians, physicians, construction. Um, I depend on the SEO. I depend on them to find me because because that means they already have the mindset. They've got this awful pain point and they need help. Right. Yeah, I tell my, my speaker coaching students, look, I don't care how good your keynote is or your TEDx even, but if they don't need what you have to say, they're not going to book you. So it's made my life so much simpler. I, you know, I, I do one thing and I market to four or five groups, period. If you go to suicide prevention speakers, plural, dental, suicide prevention speakers, plural, dental on Google, I have at least the first five organic listings are not oh, six, seven, brilliant. Six, yeah, because that's that's I work really hard to, you know, to dominate that market. So, and they came one of the big one of the big dental groups came looking for me. It's called the Seattle Study Club. Yeah, and they huge. yeah they have all, all of the country, and they never had anybody speak on suicide at the showcase. Can I tell as an entertainer? Can I tell you what I did for dramatic effect? Well, with that set up, now you have to. Come on, let's have, no, have to. Yeah, 15 minute showcase. So you said 50 or 5 0 or 15? 1 5. Got 15 it. minutes. Okay. So I, one person dies by suicide. At that time, one person was dying by suicide every 15 minutes in the US. So rather than have a PowerPoint, I found a countdown clock that looked kind of like the one with a bomb on, you know, or something on uh, 20, the series 24. And as soon as I hit the stage, on both screens is this countdown clock. As soon as I hit the stage, the clock starts counting down. And I said, every year in the United States, 47,000 people die by suicide. That's one every 15 minutes. Which means, and I look back at the clock, somebody somewhere in this country, in my tribe, has less than 15 minutes to live. The good news is we can make a difference. We can save a life. We can do it by doing something as simple as what we're doing right here, and that's start a conversation. So all during this thing, they're watching me and they're watching that fucking clock. Sorry, they're watching that clock because um, they want to know, am I going to let the guy die? Right. So at 30 seconds, I say, the good news is we can make a difference. We can save a life. We can do it by doing something as simple as starting a conversation. And I got the guy in the back, you know, the tech guy in the back. He's, he's hovering his hand over the stop right. button. 
Seven seconds, boom, stops it. I mean, they're on their feet. They're crying <laughs> and clapping. The woman who booked me, it's the Speaker Bureau, Gina DeVilla. She came up afterwards, and she used to work five-star on the speaker. So somewhere back, way back in the day. Anyway, she said to me, Frank, I've been to, I can't tell you how many speaker showcases in my 20-year career. I have never seen anybody in 15 minutes get them to laugh, to cry, and give them a standing ovation. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I knew, I thought it would work. I ran it by another <laughs> entertainer when I was working a ship, and they go, oh, man, that's amazing. And sure enough. Sweet idea, yeah. dude. Yeah, it it's a uh, sweet idea. Well, I'm kind of, I, I'm in awe of you because here we are able to uh, talk about such a heavy topic and you're you're still firing off several jokes per minute. And here we are talking about the brilliance of the creative uh, notion of working a timer, but it's all wrapped around suicide, which is pretty freaking heavy. So I think that's your gift, right? You're able to talk about something so horrifying in a way that I find myself laughing. Well, and there's a philosophical, there's a psychological principle. If you have something really heavy duty to, to share with somebody, and then following that, you can give them a little comic relief. Then it prepares them mentally for the next piece of heavy business coming down the pike. So that's why it's, you know, funny anecdote, funny anecdote, funny anecdote. A friend of mine who'd never seen me perform when I sit on stage, you know, I know what my gun tastes like, spoiler alert, I didn't pull the trigger. He comes up afterwards. He goes, hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I go, hey, man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? <laughs> Which, again, that's just in there for, you know, and then I go on to the next heavy piece of business. It's And it part of it is people have an idea in their mind what mental illness looks and sounds like. And they see me up there, you know, comedian, relatively high functioning it challenges their, you know, their perceptions. And if you change perception, you can change prejudices. You know, I've had somebody say to me, I don't know anybody with mental illness. Oh, yes, you do. Right. <laughs> you just don't know you know anybody with mental illness. Well, I've got, um, I'm afraid, I don't want to out them here, but I have somebody in my family dealing with depression. And what's been interesting to me and something that you know all about is once you mention that, Oh, it comes out of the closet. Everyone says, oh, me too. Me too. Uh-huh. Me too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, that's what I discovered when I was putting together my first TEDx. Hardly anybody talks about depression and suicide. However, like I said, if you bring it up, everybody's got a story. It's like they're waiting for somebody to utter the magic words. And if we have time, I see we're up near the top of the hour. I don't know how long your time you've got. I, yeah, yes, we have. To. If you're willing, I'd love to go on. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, the... I'm on a ship, we're going to sh a cruise ship, and I'm in the Lido, and we're at sea, so it's, you know, breakfast is jammed because nobody's getting off the boat that day, and I can't find a seat, and I look over, woman, table for two, nobody in the other chair, so I point, she nods, I sit, she goes, hey, are you the comedian? I go, hey, did you enjoy the comedy show? She said, I did, I said, then I'm the comedian. <laughs> yeah, she laughed her, she goes, what would, I, what would you have said if I told you I hated it? Um, they tell me I look a lot like him. She asked me a question, which many people have asked me in my 10 year cruise career. Is this all you do? Oh, no. I said, I'm a public speaker. I just nailed down a TEDx talk. I got an email today. I got nobody else to tell it to. So I got a nice. TEDx talk. Nice. She goes, I love TED. What's the topic? Well, I had this conversation many times. I thought I knew what was coming. So I said to her, depression and suicide and started to count down in my head. Three, two, one. She goes, Frank, I tried to kill myself twice. We have just met. She goes, first time in college, not that serious, kind of half-hearted. Second time, much more serious. I had graduated college. I had graduated medical school. I had the knowledge, had the equipment. She goes, I had the IV started in my ankle. Suicide cocktail in one hand, syringe in the other, getting ready to load it up. Phone rings. Do I answer? She said, well, I thought better. Somebody might worry, come over, interrupt. Picks up the phone, her 13-year-old son. Hmm. She goes, I don't know if he heard something in my voice or had a premonition, but he said, mom, don't do anything. So she said, I didn't. I didn't give up on the idea of suicide, but I wasn't going to do it that day because I knew he'd always feel guilty. Wasn't there something he could say or do to stop my suicide? And fortunately, there are things you could say. There are things you could do. I said to her, how old is he now? She goes, he's 21. I said, does he know his phone call saved your life? And this became not only the theme of that first TEDx talk, but the theme of my speaking business. 
I said, does he know the phone call saved your life? She goes, no. How do you start that conversation? So start the conversation became the overarching theme of my TEDx. And 95% of the time when I do a corporate gig or association gig on this topic, the meeting planner says to me, we just brought you in here to start the conversation on suicide. I knew that <laughs> because it lets, it gives people permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences yeah. without recrimination. I mean, and I'm telling you, Brad, when I, I, I do a general Q and A, and I say, guys, look, if you got a question you don't want to ask in front of everybody, I'll hang out till everybody gets their individual questions answered. And some days, some days, sometimes there's two people. Sometimes there's eight. It's like having office hours or something. So I always allow an extra half an hour and whatever my, you know, my mental clock uh, after the to to take the questions of everybody who has a because it's mysterious to, to to neurotypical people. It's very mysterious because how could you ever right. feel that bad that you want to end your life? And then there are people with mental illness who oftentimes share stuff with me. They haven't shared with anybody, including their therapist. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's well, rewarding. Uh, you do so many things so well, but I just love the way you're, you kind of destigmatize it just by talking about it. Yes. You, you know, you, you right, say right, as right. a joke, that's when I found out what my gun, gun tasted like. That is not funny. Yet it's funny, and yeah, I, and you just got started. Yeah, and I say, spoiler alert, I didn't pull the trigger. That gets a nervous laugh. Should we be laughing at this? And then I followed up with a story about the guy who came up and said, "Why didn't you pull the trigger?" Much bigger laugh. Well, it's so the stigma is real. My uh, my father-in-law's dad killed himself, but that's not the story. The story goes like this: My father. Um, had a gun go off while he was cleaning it in his bathroom. And I'm like... As, as you would. Right. Like, why do, <laughs> why are we not saying he killed himself? On yes. Tragic accident, a gun cleaning accident. Like, okay, in I the bath, we in just the bathroom. talk about it. Yeah, we in need the bathroom where he was soaping it up. Um, no, it's, it happens all the time. The hospitals are famous for doctor dies by suicide, but nobody knows that yet. What happened to Dr. Johnson? He died suddenly. Oh, is that the code? Doctor? Yeah, because because more than one physician dies by suicide every day in the U.S. Every day. And no hospital wants to lead the league or medical school wants to lead the league in physician homicide. Mm. So they're very closed mouth about it. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's that that's a tough market to break into because, you know, they're doctors. So you told me which industries you speak to those leading industries what's your like what's a what's a great gig who are you you know who who hires you that you just love it let's pretend there's no covid <laughs> oh yeah no covid well i i got hired by um the um national boiler makers association that's why i'm going to florida to speak to them it's it's construction <laughs> uh, you know it's a construction industry it's one of the trades and so that's that's who hired me people who have and they want me to do not only the suicide prevention, but also what can a, an employer do in that vein, mm -hmm. which I have, um, I have, you know, like I have facts and figures and things, action items for that. And they also want some um, COVID sort of, I have a keynote called uh, see, social distancing and staying sane. Don't worry so much about your mentally ill friends because as a mentally Ill, Ill person, uh, the world's uncertain every day whether there's a pandemic or not. So if you're gonna be high functioning, you need to have systems in place, self-care plan, routine, things you can control because everything else always seems so much right. out of control. And so I've been teaching that, apparently it's transferable. I've been teaching that to neuronormal people to help them survive because they may be having what's called situational depression. And if they've never been depressed, they may not even know what it is. Why can't I get out of bed in the morning? So that's my job is to educate them. This is what depression looks and sounds like. If you, you know, if you have trouble getting out of bed, rallying in the afternoon, if you're letting your personal hygiene go, can't eat, eat too much, can't sleep, sleep too much. Those are classic signs of depression. You need to call up your company, drag out the EAP, Employee Assistance Program or whatever, and figure out what mental health benefits you have and do a telemedicine appointment. No. But you know, every now and then somebody calls me because I give up my phone number every keynote. I go, look, here's the deal. If you're suicidal, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or text HELP to 741741. If you're just having a really bad day, call a crazy person. Here's my phone number. 
and people call uh, about oh, themselves, yeah. about their loved ones, you know. And Back home like, the other night. I, I saw ahead. you at the Boilermakers thing, and he gave me the phone number. And Heard you on the podcast. They put your phone number in the show notes. Well, yeah, so what's going on? Well, I'm really depressed, and I'm suicidal, and and um, I'm I found, you know, I'm checking the Amtrak schedule. I said, oh, you know, that he's not going to be, well, he would be catching a train, but not in any traditional fashion. So I said, well, look, I'm not going to tell you not to kill yourself, but what I would ask is not that way. Because undoubtedly, when you're on the tracks, you're going to lock eyes with that engineer. And you won't be around to be bothered by that. But that person will probably never forget the look on your face right before the train mowed you over. And you're going to ruin, you're going to ruin their life as well. You know, and I said, look, here's the deal. If you're, if you're suicidal... <laughs> And you want to take somebody with you, pick some worthless jackass, you know, then put the bomb vest on, then wrap your arms around and then pull the thing. Ugh. I know, but see, I, the, feel, the bit... I feel so torn because I want, I'm, it's funny and I want to laugh and I, I want <laughs> yeah, to laugh. I know. Uh, but, but because I can have that kind of frank, pardon the pun, frank discussion with him, you know, it's, it's, because I hear the same music, you don't have to explain anything. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to tell him he should be doing this and should be doing that. I'm just there to listen and co-sign whatever BS he's waiting through is my job. I'm not a clinician. I, I'm just there to plant a seed or two of hope because that's almost all it takes most times is just a seed of hope just to give him something to hang on to. You're a good man. One of my favorite compliments, which you have earned. Oh, thank you, thank is, you, Brad. <laughs> it is, uh, you are the right person in the right job. I love uh, saying that when it's true. I, I Well, thank you, Brad. I, I, I firmly believe that. I, You know, it's like back, people used to say to me, uh, tell me about yourself. I'm a comedian. No, not what you do, who you are. Well, at the risk of being redundant, I'm a comedian. Because I, I am <laughs> to my core. And by the way, I believe my comedic ability, you know, imagination, creativity, are simply the flip side of my depression and mental illness. It's all the same wiring. I could teach you to write stand up. I could teach somebody to do stand up. I cannot teach them to process the information coming in the way my brain does. And the, the example I give people is to bring it home. If you've ever been sitting in a movie theater, it's a comedy, and you're laughing out loud at something. And when you stop laughing, you realize you were the only one laughing at that particular moment. You got it. They did. I said, that's what my life is like 24, seven, 365. It's my brain's always on you know, the prowl for the <laughs> turn of a phrase or the, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I can't shut it off. It just works that way. I was on a zoom call last night with a, a group from our church with my wife. It's a, just a purely social thing. And they're all grandparents except for Kim and I. Um, and it's just really hard for me to, edit myself because I'll I just want to do these little you know I want to say that's what she said I just want to constantly want to make jokes and a lot of these people have only met me through zoom so it's just weird yeah because they have no idea although I have used that to my advantage I mean I can you know if they don't know you're a comic and you say something you're really witty I'm standing behind a guy in line at the grocery store I don't know if you ever do this but I'm looking at what everybody else is buying it's a guilty pleasure and the the um, oil spill, the um, what was the the big uh, oil spill in the Gulf, um, like hundreds of thousands of gallons a minute. Uh, the BP oil spill had just happened, and so the oil is pouring into the Gulf as, as I'm standing there. And the guy in front of me has got a bag of frozen shrimp and a quart of motor oil. <laughs> and up to this, up to this point, I think everybody thinks the way I do, but I thought I'd put it to the test. So I'm staring at that, waiting for somebody else because everybody else is looking at everybody else's stuff. I'm waiting for somebody else to do the joke. Three, two, <laughs> one. I go, hey, man, that's kind of an interesting choice. Um, frozen shrimp and motor oil. Are you going to be serving those uh, Louisiana style? And the cashier's been over double laughing. She goes, you should be a comedian. I go, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> and it drove home the point that not everybody thinks, you know, nobody else. Yeah. I thought maybe I, I was just beating everybody to the punchline every time. But no, that's not the way it works. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, d deal. With, I think everybody who's funny for a living learns that at some point. But I, I definitely remember times where the connection between two unrelated things 
seems obvious to me. And then you get people say like, how do you, you're so creative. I'm like, how can you not see that that's funny? Yeah, no, that's, I think comedians, comic magicians are famous. We, we see connections where other, and usually to, oftentimes to unrelated things, it makes it very funny because they're unrelated. You know, that's part of the, that's what uh, Judy Carter's book, The Comedy Bible, she talks about two unrelated things you can connect like that can, can, that can be the magic. Right. And, you know, that's, uh, yeah, so. Well, I was talking to just recently in National Speakers Association, a group of entry level speakers, and somebody wanted to know what a callback was. And, you know, studying callbacks, I just, <laughs> but it, to me, it's like, well, you just, Refer in a funny fashion to something you talked about a while back. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a technique. And I've, I've complimented, complimented civilians. I go, do you realize there's a name for that in comedy? It's called a callback. It's And they're worth their weight in gold. Nicely done. Right. And every now and then, I love screwing around with neurotypical people. Especially when I'm tired and my little editor has gone to sleep in my head. I called in an Uber. Nice young man driving. After two, three hours suicide prevention CE trainings that I put on. I'm just exhausted. And our eyes meet in the rearview mirror, and he goes, how you doing? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell him. I'm depressed and suicidal. How about you? <laughs> well, that is hilarious and mean. There's a pause, and he goes, what am I supposed to say to that? I said, do you really want to know? He goes, yeah. I said, you're supposed to ask me, do I have a plan? Because that's the protocol. And he goes, uh, do you have a plan? And then there's this beat, and he looks back at the rearview mirror, and he goes, does it involve Uber? <laughs> I said, man, that is brilliant. Oh. I'm going to be telling that story. That's what I was thinking. Tell me that didn't make it to your next uh, Oh, yes, absolutely. Because I do like, you know, because you get tired after a while of telling people I'm fine, I'm living the dream. When you're not, that's why I tell people with mental illness, you can just surround yourself with people you know, love and trust to understand what you're going through. Not going to judge, just there for you. Your pit crew when the wheels come off. Um, because they're not shocked, you know, because it is shocking to a lot, you know, you talk about, yeah, somebody said to me, how long since your last thought of killing yourself? I said, what time is it? What? Yeah. It's just the way my brain works, you know? Yeah. I, earlier today, I was sitting at a train, you know, railroad crossing, and arms coming down, lights are flashing, I'm thinking, you know, if I tap the gas, I'll be on the tracks, that'd be that. What? But that's how I think. That's the way my brain works. Or does it, depending on your view yeah. of the... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm purposely letting that sit there because I, I don't want to follow up with a joke because it's real. Yeah, it's real. And, but, you know, it's... and Well, I, I actually, when I told the story the first time, I followed it with a joke. Because what really happened was I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, how far would I have to back up in the car to go through the first crossing, you know, and end up on the tracks and not actually go through the second on the other side. Because if I went all the way through, now I'm on the other side of the tracks. I've broken two of their, you know, crossing arms and I owe the railroad for both of them. I need to be going no faster than just to get to that first one and stay on the tracks. And the guy look, guy's looking at me like, I go, it's a math problem. It's just, you know, it's just like two trains leave Chicago. I, I'm just trying to calculate. I, I'm not serious. I'm just. Yeah, but All right. it gives, gives me credibility with people with mental illness. They know right away. You know, well, so I think the word you might call me is neurotypical. That was a word I learned from you. Yes, um, or neuronormal. Everyone's learning from you, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, In all the best yeah, ways. And, and you know what? Uh, uh, as I said, I was very jealous early years in NSA when everybody had, you know, uh, we're making was making a difference except me. So now now I'm making up for it. Times times ten. What's up with my phone? Can you believe this? Aren't you supposed you to You are a popular guy. Recording a podcast? <laughs> no, it's, it's it's the whole nature of Zoom. You know, I'm I'm doing a, a virtual keynote the other day and I'm a minute and thirty seconds from the end. And the all of a sudden I, I, knew, I didn't know the time, but it was a UPS guy banging on my door right behind. <laughs> I'm, I'm building a big close, you know, a big punchline. Bam, 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 bam. Uh, I'll be right with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the yeah. nature of the beast. You know, it's just, uh, I find that to be a good thing. When I first got started with a home office, I, I went to unreasonable, stupid lengths to hide the fact that I had a home office. Oh, and yeah. now it's like, well, duh. 
yeah cattail goes across you know yeah, yeah it's whatever. you know it, it's 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 i'm afraid and it, i heard a couple of guys talking this morning on a podcast you know it's uh it's here to stay it's probably not i mean we'll all go back to meeting live and conferences you know people miss that personal you know networking but I, i'm guessing a, a slice of it will remain on zoom smaller associations you know different meetings they've learned they could do it on zoom so right it, you know there's a lot, like I, I said last night i was on a social group with a bunch of grandparents tell me that's not a good thing you know a lot of those people aren't getting out a lot anyway yeah. so this, absolutely. Absolutely. that is a gift that is going to keep giving and as a speaker I've spoken this uh, during the pandemic in South Africa and Nigeria and and um, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been all over the world without ever leaving my living room. I'm in my bunny slippers and I'm I'm speaking to a medical school in Nigeria. <laughs> That's super cool. I mean, that probably wouldn't have happened without the pandemic. So, you know. Well, Frank King, we're at the place I warned you would be. I'm going to ask you this last question. Uh -oh. hope, and here's here's how it goes. Frank King, the mental health comedian. Correct. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is that eight out of ten people who are seriously suicidal are ambivalent. And nine out of ten people who are circling up to a suicide give hints in the last seven days leading up to the attempt, which means that eight out of ten and nine out of ten all want somebody to step in interrupt and say something. So what gives me hope is suicide is the most preventable cause of death on the planet. Anybody can stop a suicide and you can do it by doing something as simple as we're doing right here. And that is start the conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I do edit pretty well on the fly. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, Mentalhealthcomedian.com. Is that right? No, the mental health comedian. The mental health or, comedian. As we say down south, the mental health comedian. Well, or, and, uh, Google you because uh, you got how many TED Talks? Um, I've got, I've recorded five. I uh, just booked my sixth one in June. I actually have been invited eight times, but I had a conflict on the calendar with the other two. So it'll be six after June. Uh, that makes me happy. Well, you're oh, a good too. man. I'm so glad to. <laughs> I feel so lucky to get to spend an hour with you. Thanks for saying that. And how long, you, how long have you been doing the podcast? Uh, well, it's been a thousand years there. Um, uh, Not so it's on. Uh... Purely a pandemic thing. It started like this, Frank. I said, um, maybe I ought to learn video. I wish I had gigs. And then I realized, I, uh, I found out about Facebook Live, which I didn't know existed. But it, it just means you can have a gig, a 14-year-old with a, webcam can have a gig by pushing the red button yes so We're i decided, now, ladies and gentlemen. decided to push that red button and now it it kind of grew and the feedback's been nice and so now i oh, take good. a little more time to publish it yeah and i, I all my speaker coaching clients look you need a podcast in your topic area and you need to be guesting at least twice a week on somebody else's podcast let them do the heavy lifting the editing and all that just go on and be a great guest on your topic and i probably guests appear half dozen times a week at least on other people's podcasts just for the seo and the, you know, the google juice or whatever yeah right right on well um along those lines if i can be a guest on yours let me know <laughs> oh yeah you want to be on the suicide prevention punchline and the funny shrink uh, whatever fits of course I, and, the answer is yes 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 how old are you 55 and you could be on uh, over 50 and effing funny and we you know, we tell jokes, we tell road stories, horror stories. Help me you know. in. I'll send you a link. I got some road stories. I imagine you do. It's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot of fun hanging out. It's kind of like a green room, you know, uh, yeah. a theater where you're working with a couple other people, you know, and you're back there shooting the breeze before or after the show. To me, there so. is nothing more fun than being with a bunch of like-minded people saying, like, that really happened? Yeah, it totally did. Because no, yes. no one else gets it. No, as a friend of mine said to me when I bumped into him in the airport, he goes, oh, thank God. He goes, Frank, you understand comedians are like circus freaks. Nobody else understands the business unless you're a circus freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, even our wives, you know, my wife is great, but she doesn't truly understand what it's like to stand up on stage and have people hate you or, or adore you or all the yep. weird stuff in between. Yep. Um, I love my wife 
of 33 years, been through all of this with me. Um, you know, it's one of those things that seven years in a row either makes a marriage or breaks it. Bankruptcy either makes a marriage or breaks it. And so we've, you know, we've survived. It's, it, it's been an interesting ride, she would tell you. You know, it's not not all been a bed of roses, but it's, it's it hadn't been dull, Brad. <laughs> well, it sounds like you got the right woman. Uh, oh, God. Oh, yeah. Everybody, Thank thanks for joining us. Frank, holds on just for a second. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody.